Hey, my name is Roman Harkovsky. I'm with IBM WebSeer technical sales team. In this session, I would like to discuss open source messaging and compare that to IBM messaging product, IBM MQ. This is the presentation that I've done at the IBM Interconnect conference in February in Las Vegas. And the recording from that conference turned out to have a lot of background noise. A lot of people walked in and out of the room, so I decided to use a clean recording from my office here in Pittsburgh, beautiful Pennsylvania. In, in the next hour or so, I'll cover some of the general topics on message-oriented middleware and I'll discuss overall IBM integration portfolio. We'll talk about performance tests that I have completed. We'll talk about high availability transactional integrity, management, monitoring, administration. We'll discuss security a little bit, talk about some other considerations, and we'll spend quite a few minutes on the license costs on TCA, TCO, total cost of ownership, total cost of acquisition. These are the topics that get confused often, and I'd like to bring some clarity to those. First of all, why would anybody want to use message-oriented middleware? There are so many different protocols and options available to developers to communicate from one application to another. So there are things like HTTP and REST and all kinds of ATOM and other protocols that people can use. The interesting part about message-oriented middleware is that it gives you a very nice flexibility and it provides a level of abstraction over the network and the combined qualities of all of the different options of message-oriented middleware, you cannot find all of those in different protocols. You can find some, but not others. So, for instance, with messaging protocols, such as provided by IBM MQ and some other messaging systems, for instance, you could support reliable and transactional messages, or you could do best effort messages, if you'd like. It was messaging middleware, you could use asynchronous or synchronous messaging. And again, with HTTP, you can simulate asynchronous, but you'd mostly do synchronous messaging. With message-oriented middleware, you could use publish-subscribe mechanisms with topics, with filters, and all kinds of really interesting things. Something that, for instance, with HTTP protocol will be very difficult to simulate. You'd have to use other add-on capabilities, libraries, frameworks, and so forth. You could use different present representations on the wire. For instance, if you need to have very low latency, very, very high speed, lower power usage for slow networks or for expensive networks, you could start using MQTT protocol on the wire. And the API it does not depend on the wire representation. You could have the same API, for instance, JMS is one such example, and that's a programming API where on the wire, JMS could generate any representation, and the wire representations generated by ActiveMQ are not compatible with the wire representation generated by IBM MQ. But the nice thing, the programming interface does not change. The programmers use the same, in this case, JMS API or some other messaging API. Now, the nice thing, one of the nicest things about messaging is that you can decouple message producers from consumers. And you can do that both logically and physically. The other benefit of message-oriented middleware is that you can define routing of messages to their final destination through administrative means. In other words, when you initially write the software, you can just logically use message uh, queue names, topic names, but then administrator can define a complex topology which could be distributed potentially across multiple data centers, uh, somewhat like DNS in the IP addressing, but this could be managed and controlled by the administrator for messaging system. So that is a significant benefit of the message-oriented middleware, which could be somewhat difficult, not impossible, but difficult to replicate with other uh, protocols for communication. Another benefit of messaging is certainly ability to transform messages as they pass 
through the server and that's when you could use the messaging connected to the app server and you can transform those messages inside of the application server or inside of the ESB or you could pick up messages with one client and that client could transform messages put them back on the server so there are more than one way to do it and some of this is possible to do with non message oriented middleware but it's not necessarily quite as easy as if you were using moms the other benefit is that the programming apis for messaging could be quite flexible and they could include selectors for messages expiration um, picking up messages in the sequence and you could define priorities first in first out first in last out those kinds of things this is very powerful and again a lot of these things are quite difficult to get with other communication paradigms uh, the other benefit is that you could use many different programming languages C sharp Java Ruby PHP JavaScript whatever their visual basic many different languages to communicate with these messaging systems now again none of these things are necessarily unique when you take them one by one they're not unique to the message oriented middleware but given that the message oriented middleware provides all of these together in a single product that's what makes it unique you get the flexibility and power and overall the benefits of using a messaging system it gives you a nice level of abstraction which provides for easy programming experience it gives you reliability availability and scalability and that is configurable by operation person or system administrator you can distribute your messages you can run it heterogeneous environments multiple operating systems multiple languages protocols and you can configure high levels of security depending on the requirements of the messaging system so all of these are very very beneficial for many applications perhaps not all of them but a lot of them now let's talk about the IBM and open source sometimes it is perceived that IBM may not necessarily support open source or IBM does not embrace open source nothing could be further from the truth in IBM we have what we call IBM open source plus strategy the thing is today it's impossible to build products completely from scratch because there are a lot of components in the modern software that are being produced collectively by multiple vendors and other contributors in open source projects in IBM we have several thousand IBMers that contribute to dozens and dozens of different open source projects and we reuse those projects for our software just like in the car industry it's impossible to produce the car entirely for a single company for instance Honda or General Motors they don't go out they don't mine iron from the mountain and then melt it and then produce their own nuts and bolts and they don't go get the rubber and silicone and oil uh, they don't have their own facilities to manufacture every little piece uh, for instance glass and so forth they source those components from other providers the hardware is not open source but the thing is in the car industry a lot of manufacturers of the final cars they do source a lot of the common components from very similar vendors like Pittsburgh glass company PPG provides glass to many different car manufacturers the same thing in open source IBM and Oracle and Red Hat and other vendors collaborate on many open source projects and then some of those projects are being used in some of the products in IBM case for instance MQ uses over 30 open source packages WebSphere application server and Liberty profile use over 100 open source packages IBM Worklight uses over 100 open source packages IBM Big Insights uses more than 40 open source packages so there are lots of them that we use and for MQ and WebSphere application server we're using 
things like Apache CXF and Dojo and OpenJPA, Eclipse Link and lots of other open source projects. Some of those open source projects IBM has created to begin with, some of them like Eclipse and others, we have contributed and we are leading some of those open source projects and we're contributing ongoing basis um, like OpenJDK is one another example not shown here it is a very active process and IBM participates in open source very deeply and we are leveraging the best of open source in IBM products this is not dissimilar from Red Hat for instance if you look at the JBoss application server there are a lot of open source projects built into JBoss. Red Hat does not own 100% of those open source projects. They are reusing a lot of them from the community. And it's a very similar model to IBM. Now if we look at the overall integration portfolio of IBM and we compare that to open source, you could see that there are certain areas where you can find open source options and there are certain areas where you cannot so for instance in messaging if you look at the IBM MQ or MQ Lite there are open source alternatives like Apache Active MQ which will be the subject of this presentation there's Pivotal Rabbit MQ there's a clicks Paho Open MQ for ESB for message for enterprise service bus there is IBM Integration Bus, which is the IBM ESB product. In open source world, there is Mule ESB, Apache Service Mix, Apache Synapse, Ultra ESB, Talent, Sprint Integration, Pedals ESB, and a few others. So there are quite a few open source ESB products. For governance and API management, IBM has Web, service, Web Sphere Service Register and Repository and IBM API Management. In open source world, there are several different options that you will find. The Red Hat API Man, WSO2 registry, and so forth. In terms of adapters, IBM Integration Bus includes a number of adapters. And with Advanced Edition, they're all free. Adapters for SAP, for people of JD Edwards, and obviously all of the technology adapters. In open source world, there are many different components and projects in Mule and other independent adapters that you could use. For B2B integration, there's IBM product Sterling B2B integration. In open source, there are several uh, products. They may not be well known, but there are some. Um, I have not used any of these things so I can't really speak for their maturity level. For managed file transfer there is IBM MQ managed file transfer and there is Sterling Connect Direct product. In open source world there are several managed file transfer products again I have not used these so I don't know and can't speak to their maturity level. So this was all software and that software you can install on premise or run in the cloud do-it-yourself type approach. In terms of appliances where you have the hardware and pre-integrated software as a firmware, IBM provides a messaging appliance which is MQ appliance that was announced in the middle of February. So that's a new appliance that we have. Uh, very powerful, pre-tuned, pre-configured, pre-install. All you do is just unplug and include and then you can quickly configure it and run it. For cloud integration, there is IBM cast iron appliance, there is IBM message site appliance for machine-to-machine um, -machine Internet of Things messaging, uh, security gateway, for, which is data power, XI-52 appliance, very, very popular. That's probably IBM bestseller out of all of the appliances that we have, uh, and it's been doing very well in the last several years. A lot of financial, military, industry, government, industries, insurance use data power uh, as a security gateway. B2B appliance. Open source obviously does not deliver appliances because you can't download the hardware. So there is none in every one of these categories. In terms of the software as a service and platform as a service, IBM does provide several choices here. For managed file transfer, we have 
software as a service as a sterling file transfer for api management we have ibm software as a service for api management and for integration we have platform as a service so there is mq lite running in ibm bluemix there's bluemix node red for basic integration needs we provide patterns for ibm integration bus on pure application system which you can run on premise platform as a service or you can run it on soft layer as a platform as a service in terms of open source I'm not aware of any software as a service as open source but there are some open source cloud products as well as open source platform as a service products including Red Hat OpenShift, iPaaS, Mule Cloud Hub and so forth now one thing to mention is that despite the fact there are quite a few different open source products listed here and in, under software and under platform as a service and software as a service the maturity level of all of these products varies where in IBM case we're shipping market leading products we have generated lots of revenue from these products and we're reinvesting this revenue back into the enhancements of these products in open source world some of these projects are very small some of them are still beta not even not even fully generally available uh, so the your mileage and success with this project will projects will vary so you really need to do a good due diligence and validate these products if it's just a guy and his dog in the garage or if it's a reputable company with significant install base behind some of these products so just uh, be aware of that since I mentioned market share you could see the Gartner market share numbers in different categories business process management enterprise service bus message oriented middleware managed file transfer transaction processing appliances b2b application servers portals and application service governance in most of these ibm is ranked as number one and you could see that the growth rate for ibm in some cases is faster than the industry growth rate so you could see the industry growth rate in this column and IBM growth in this column so you could see we're growing faster than the market in many cases in other cases for instance in application servers we, we may not be number one but that's because of the different accounting strategies that for instance Oracle uses to report their application server revenue for application servers um, and that's a subject for a different discussion but we are growing faster than Oracle in application server space now let's move on to ActiveMQ so ActiveMQ is open source Apache project it's delivered with Apache 2.0 license and you can download it and use it free of charge even in production not only development because of the Apache license it is very permissive you can change the source code you don't have to contribute back uh, like in LGPL licenses or GPL um, so that's a benefit of Apache 2.0 license very commercially friendly um, you can resell it run it in production uh, and so forth you can also get commercial support for ActiveMQ if you'd like there are several companies listed on Apache website where you can get that commercial support from I don't know the quality of support from some of these companies um, Red Hat is probably better known from all of these ones and the pricing structure is not published for all of these companies so you would have to call them and validate what kind of quality you get for for the price that you paid ActiveMQ does have deployments in different industries so it's not a new product it was created several years ago and it is relatively mature product and it's built in Java and it supports JMS 1.1 there is no JMS 2.0 support at this point uh, you would have to use JDK open JDK or Sun JDK or IBM JDK to run it uh, you can write clients in several different languages Java C++ and some others in terms of the wire protocol it does support by default open wire which is proprietary protocol used pretty much only by ActiveMQ in terms of the protocols it does support the T2 
TCP and HTTP in-memory protocol and some others. Um, usually for normal enterprise level applications you would probably be using TCP protocol 99% of the time. There are some high availability options and replication options which we'll discuss later. It does come with a basic administration console, I'll talk about that later. And at this moment, the next generation of ActiveMQ is called Apache Apollo Project. So the ActiveMQ is being significantly changed and rewritten as we speak. Now, one thing to mention about the ActiveMQ is that it is a default JMS provider in Apache Geronimo application server. And you can use it as JMS provider in other Java Enterprise Edition servers. You could even use it in WebSphere or WebLogic or JBoss if you want. Um, but it is recommended that you run it standalone because the footprint of ActiveMQ in terms of memory is quite significant. So for high performance applications, you're better off running ActiveMQ as a standalone server. Now let's talk about the performance benchmark that I have done in the winter of 2014-2015 and I finished this recently and I also published a blog article recently on ywebster.com. Uh, so you could see it here at this moment it is the latest blog article so you could see the description of the test cases you can see download and use the installation scripts you can see performance numbers that I have generated from this benchmark uh, and a description and full download of all of the scripts uh, in my tests what I had was a setup on a dedicated server and that server was Intel IBM X-Series server 24 cores running VMware ESX hypervisor and I had three virtual machines one virtual machine was called client host second was MQ host and the third was AMQ host so they all had eight cores each and a different amount of memory you can find all of those details and specs and software version numbers and all of the other details in my blog article on ywebster.com for generation of the workload I used IBM performance harness for JMS and that was connected to IBM virtual machine and ActiveMQ virtual machine and I didn't run the test concurrently it was done in sequence because uh, I was using pers persistent testing persistent messages I used solid state disk to store the messages and this provided me with a high performance storage option so the requesters for the test the performance harness was run in requester mode it will send the message to the server the message will be picked up from the request queue by the responder threads that were local in both cases local responders they will pick up the message then they will put the message back into the reply queue and then the requester will get that message from the reply, reply queue back into the uh, requester message so that was a full round trip that was going through the messaging server and back into this VM to generate the workload I played with different number of queues different number of instances of servers from one to four servers and I created number of different threads and played with many different configuration settings in the environment um, for ActiveMQ I used different heap sizes from 1 gigabyte to 16 gigabyte I played with different Linux kernel settings used different number of requesters and responders from 20 up to 150 uh, input queues and output queues from 1 to 100 did all kinds of changes to prefetch sizes in ActiveMQ uh, used different transports for ActiveMQ but ended up using OpenWire because that was the fastest but I did play with different switches in OpenWire with tight encoding, caching, on and off, Nagle and so forth different socket buffer sizes, different I.O. buffer sizes so I went through performance tuning manuals for ActiveMQ as well as WebSphere MQ IBM MQ I ran tests anywhere from 3 minutes up to 24 hours and the final results were generated by averaging 6 independent performance test runs for 1 hour each for persistence in ActiveMQ I ended up using Kaha 
database because the level DB is still not the default and it failed under the heavy stress test uh, in a 24 hour period so I, I could not make use of level DB in fact if you look at the gyre records in the bug tracking database there are some issues open against level DB and I'd be surprised if anybody is using level DB for any kind of level mission critical heavy workload on the system in my previous benchmarks Last year, when I tested previous version of ActiveMQ and IBM MQ, I had multiple solid-state drives. In this hardware, this was a more recent hardware, I only had single SSD. When I, when I was doing the testing, I monitored memory, CPU usage, disk usage, and network utilization. Now, I have spent a lot of time trying to do my best to do the tuning, but I can't pretend to achieve the performance the maximum performance of the system because I'm sure if somebody from the Hersley lab or from Red Hat or some somebody who is an expert in ActiveMQ I'm sure they could probably squeeze a few extra percentage points from the configuration uh, given that they're probably had significant performance tuning experience uh, mine is limited to several performance tuning projects that I have done with these products so finally the results that I got from my configuration were as follows uh, for 256 byte message all the way up to 1 megabyte message I had 42% faster performance in IBM MQ compared to active MQ for 20, 256 byte message I had 49% faster performance for 1k messages 88% faster for 10k 108% faster for 100k and 61% faster for 1 megabyte. So this is quite significant difference. Again, this is, I would stress it again, persistent messaging. For non-persistent messaging, the performance difference is smaller because it doesn't use the efficiencies of IBM MQ for disk input output and I have not completed the non-persistent performance test just yet because that will require a different set of configuration tuning in most cases what I've seen is that the message oriented middleware is really used because of the reliable persistent messaging much more so than for non-persistent messaging so I think this is more relevant test case anyway in 2013 another group in IBM had done performance benchmark of the older version of MQ 7.5 and compared that to RabbitMQ so when configured for similar quality of service they found that MQ was up to three times faster than RabbitMQ for messages ranging from 3 kilobyte up to 256 kilobyte uh, so this is quite a bit of the performance difference between MQ uh, and in their case it was persistent transacted but in asynchronous mode so that's the best that you can get with RabbitMQ because RabbitMQ does not support XA transactions and it does not provide synchronous fully persisted transaction messages at least it didn't in 2013 and I don't know if it supports it now so both MQ and RabbitMQ were configured for the same quality of service and that's a result in performance that you can see on this chart now let's talk about high availability and failover MQ is well known for being very very reliable product and that's probably one of the reasons it has such a large market share uh, well over 60 percent market share so what we've done we tested Apache ActiveMQ and we simulated failures in network in hardware in software killing JVMs killing the operating system unplugging network adapters uh, cables and shutting down the hardware and what we found that no matter how hard we were trying to configure ActiveMQ with the Kaha DB for persistent engine there were several cases where we lost messages on the client or even worse we lost and duplicated messages on the server for instance when you fail the master server then you recover the server and then you restore the network interface card on what used to be the master then you end up with two masters and you have 100% of duplicate messages which is very bad because if those are financial transactions 
what that could mean potentially is that you transfer a mount twice so that's not a good thing now if you restart the former master JVM after the network failure and then you restore that then you lose all of the messages on that master because it loses all of the messages after restart and it does not come up as a slave after that restart so you either duplicate messages all of them or you lose all of the messages so none of these scenarios are good because you could withdraw money from one account but it may never make it to another account or it can make it twice so you withdraw once but you deposit twice so none of these are good outcomes for reliable transactional messaging now one thing to mention is that level db does not support xa transactions so it's not appropriate to use it for transactional payloads now if you handle all of the transaction and failover in your application in that case you might be able to use level db but we haven't tested the failover options with level db so that would be something that we'll try and test in the future if you're interested to watch the videos how this was done you can go to the youtube and you can watch video for ibm mq failover and also videos for active mq failover and it's fully documented and you can repeat the same tests in your own environment if you're interested let's talk about the transaction integrity a little bit more in ibm mq product we ship the xa transaction manager as part of the product and what you can do if you have a client that connects to MQ and you need to access for instance a database and payload and put that into the MQ it could be done under a management of IBM MQ transaction engine that's shipped with the product you don't have to have any third-party product ActiveMQ does support XA protocol what that means it could be a XA participant but you have to have external transaction manager it could be JBoss or WebLogic or WebSphere. What that means, you would have additional complexity because you have to install and configure and you have to pay for the support and licenses of that additional software. So that means another level of complexity again and, and more moving parts. So that's a little bit harder to manage. And LevelDB does not support XA transactions at all. So you would have to use Kaha DB for that configuration. Um, and if you have no transaction manager, that means you are risking of losing or duplicating messages if you write a client that picks up data from the database and puts that into the ActiveMQ. Uh, so you'd have to be careful how you handle that and you'd have to write some application logic to handle those failures. So that's something that is provided by IBM MQ. Uh, again, removing the layer of a complexity from your application code. Let's talk about monitoring, administration, and configuration of the products. This is very important for operations. Not important for development, but in production, somebody has to make sure the stuff works. Somebody has to configure the system, monitor the system, provision new servers, create clusters, update properties, change configuration of the system. In IBM MQ, we provide administrative GUI through the MQ Explorer, which is Eclipse-based, very powerful administration tool. In ActiveMQ, there's a JMX console, which is very, very basic, and there is a little bit more advanced HowTIO console. Red Hat provides JBoss Operations Network for extra charge with the JBoss AMQ product. But all of these are very, very limited in function, nowhere near the capabilities of the MQ Explorer. Now, administrative GUI is nice, but for production, managing multiple instances of servers and making that management to be as reliable and as repeatable as possible, you really need to have scripted administration. And that's where MQ provides MQSC, MQ scripting commands. Very, very powerful set of commands, very flexible, covers all of the aspects of administration of MQ. In case of active MQ, there are very limited set of commands, pretty much stop and start and a couple of others. You can't really do very much with those commands. You would have to manually or programmatically create XML files 
and that's nowhere near as easy as using MQ scripting commands. Now, sometimes you want to manage the server programmatically, not from, from the scripting environment, but programmatically from your software, from whatever programming language you like. MQ provides MQ administrative interface, so you can programmatically manage MQ. In case of active MQ, certain things can be done through JMX, but again, they're limited in their scope. In MQ, there's another way to manage the system uh, through PCF, programmable command formats. So what you can do here is you can put messages on the queue and you can designate the target for those messages so it's basically using messaging to manage the messaging product. In this case, if you have a distributed environment, you can put those command messages on the queue and they will be eventually delivered to the target servers because you can define the target queues and target servers in those messages and the commands for administration and configuration will be first delivered to those servers and then they will be executed on those servers. Uh, so this is a very handy way to do management and configuration of a large distributed environment. This is not available with ActiveMQ. Now there are also many, many, many third-party tools available for management of IBM MQ because it's a market-leading product with over 60% share. There are many third parties that provided the administrative and monitoring tools for MQ. ActiveMQ is nowhere near as popular and there are very few third-party products to manage and monitor that environment. Finally, if you want to hand manage through configuration files, you can always edit mq.ini files and some other property files in MQ, probably mostly in development environment and you can certainly do that in ActiveMQ and in fact that's how you manage MQ, ActiveMQ for the most part. So here are some examples of the IBM MQ commands and scripting environment. So you could see that you can manage all of the objects, channels, queues, client connections and all of these things. So it's very, very powerful uh, syntax and you can customize it, you can use it. So the benefit again is that your administrative scripting for production should be validated just as you validate and QA all of your application programs because administrative scripts are really no different. Uh, they are different in nature, but they should have a gun. They should go through the same rigorous QA process so that your administration of production environment is just as repeatable um, as the application software. So you should really test this stuff. You should not be clicking on different configuration options in production environment. That is very dangerous. Now, if we look at the GUI for administrating or monitoring the messaging system. This is what the MQ admin console looks like. In reality, we provide MQ Explorer, which gives you very powerful monitoring capabilities, dashboarding, monitoring, statistics, and configuration for many different aspects of the system with input validation, drop down lists, wizards to create things to configure things. It's very powerful user interface and it allows you to manage and configure every aspect of the system. Queues, triggers, events, statistics, clusters, services, listeners, MQ servers, instances and so forth. So you could see messages, you can browse messages and do all kinds of advanced configuration and monitoring of the MQ environment. Now, in case of Apache ActiveMQ, the admin console looks something like this. The very basic JMS console gives you the minimum that you need just to see if it's up and running, how many messages are in what queue, but it doesn't really let you change configuration or manage the system actively. You really have to do it through the changing of XML files or API when you connect to the system, you can create a queue uh, through the connection string or you stop and start the servers through command line. So none of that stuff is available from this bare, basic bare bones JMX console. 
there are a little bit more advanced features, just a tiny bit more advanced features in the How TIO tooling. It still doesn't really let you manage much of a system, it does let you create a couple of things. Um, so it's better than the built-in JMX console, so you can download the How TIO separately. It's not shipped with ActiveMQ, but you could use that uh, for just a little bit more advanced configuration. So the summary for administration is that in IBM MQ there is a GUI, there are command line tools uh, for a single pane of glass, sort of speak, where you can manage multiple servers from a same console. Uh, very rich MQ Explorer. All of the tools have help. There are many examples on how to use them. There's performance tuning and troubleshooting guides for every version of IBM MQ we ship performance tuning guide and performance results so you can do the sizing you can see all of the different aspects of the system I haven't seen any other vendor publish performance tuning and performance reports for their messaging servers this is unique to MQ and you have many options for configuring con uh, performance and it's very well documented and there are best practices available there are very active forums with ActiveMQ command line tools are very limited it's pretty much start stop and get status but not really manage the servers especially not remotely there's no single pane of glass you have to open up the console to manage every individual server instance very limited administrative GUI supported very few administrative commands available in JMX uh, and very limited tuning configuration for different persistence engines uh, so it's overall much more limited in administrative aspects. Now a little bit about security. It's a complex topic and we have done an overall overview and comparison of IBM MQ and Apache ActiveMQ in a project recently inside of IBM and you can find some of the results uh, on the blog ywebser.com. This is just one page summary of that research project and you can see for in terms of the standard compliance MQ complies with some of the industry and federal standards for FIPS, for common criteria, for role-based security products are somewhat similar except for some of the authorization policies that are a little bit more advanced in IBM MQ for auditing the products are very similar where you can audit some of the administrative actions uh, being done for data security that's where one of the biggest differences are between the products so this is where I would like to spend some of the time here in a little bit more detail so one of the key aspects of the messaging is the ability to do message content encryption so why is this important so think about it you have a client that connects to the server and it puts a message on your server now the other consumer of the message could be another client or maybe it's another messaging system receives the messages if you do not encrypt the messages then they are stored in that server for a period of few seconds one hour several hours maybe several days and the trouble is the system administrator can browse all of the messages contents when they're stored on the server you probably remember the scandal with uh, Edward Snowden disclosing through WikiLeaks some of the secrets where he was able to get access to a lot of the confidential information this is exactly the type of problem that you want to avoid because in the messaging system you should not keep your messages unencrypted if they have any significance you should encrypt those messages so the system administrator can define the properties of the system it can he can start servers stop servers do performance tuning but he shouldn't be able to mess with the message content because that message content should be protected it should be signed and encrypted so only authorized consumers and requesters of the system should be able to access the message content but not the administrator of the system that's none of his business with MQ we provide something that we call advanced message security AMS 
which makes it very easy to encrypt the messages. It's really administrative task. It's not a programmatic task. Programmers shouldn't have to worry about it. It's very difficult to do it properly from a programming standpoint. If you've ever done encryption, you probably know how hard it is. You really have to be careful and you have to synchronize the clients and consumers of those messages. They have to use uh, proper encryption algorithms and you know, they have to worry about doing the key management and there are all kinds of issues that are very advanced and I personally don't even pretend to understand all of those issues but with the ability of using advanced message security in MQ we make it an order of magnitude easier to configure that message encryption uh, so again it's not a programmatic task it's administrative task uh, so that we can avoid those uh, people in the middle trying to snoop up and uh, publish your messages in the open uh, so that's very important there are a few other things like IP blocking to prevent denial of service attacks. There's proxy support in DMZ, some tunneling support in MQ. Uh, so some advanced security uh, concepts compared to the stuff that you do not get in active MQ. Now documentation is a big thing for any product of any significant level of complexity and message-oriented middleware is certainly not a trivial product. IBM MQ provides outstanding documentation. It is very high quality, very up-to-date for all of the latest versions. Even the beta releases are very well documented. Um, performance data is very well documented. Configuration, tuning, installation, development, operations, all of those aspects of the system are documented. IBM has free red books where you can find advanced topics, how-to guides, high availability guides, uh, configuration, security guidelines. There are some parts of the documentation that may not be easy to follow. Um, so none of the documentation is ever perfect, but I think this is very close to being perfect it's nearly perfect because it's at the very least it's very complete and up-to-date uh, something that I can't really say unfortunately about ActiveMQ the parts of the product are poorly documented they're very hard to follow for instance if you go look at the performance guides there is really nothing that's provided you have to google around and find some conflicting documentation some of it is on Stack Overflow, some on Red Hat website, some on SlideShare, some on user forums. Not always up to date. In fact, mostly not up to date. Latest versions are not really covered and most of the performance data, installation, configuration topics, advanced topics like high availability, they're really several years old and they don't cover latest configuration. No performance reports for most recent versions, no sizing guidelines. Um, and a lot of conflicting advice on tuning and some of the best practices. People tend to disagree on forums and it's hard to figure out. So you really ended up following several parallel threads and doing this yourself to find out what, what's the best thing that works for you instead of following well-established like Red Books approach where you'll get recommendations on high availability and best practices, which saves you a ton of time. One thing that we introduced recently is something that we call MQ Lite. So MQ Lite is a child project to MQ, if you wish. Uh, it uses very similar principles for messaging, uh, but it's not exactly the same. The MQ Lite was born out of the microservices architecture idea, and you can scale it very easily and you can get it in three different ways um, as a Bluemix service on IBM Bluemix platform as a service you can also download it and use it locally uh, and we also provided statement of direction to support MQ Lite applications inside of the MQ version 8 server so if you written MQ Lite clients then they can work with MQ in the future with a full MQ server. So you wouldn't have to install MQ Lite server. You will just be able to use MQ itself. The APIs are different. So we don't support JMS API, for instance, for our MQ Lite. Uh, we don't support AMQ API. So the APIs are really designed to be natural 
for those programming languages like Node.js, a JavaScript languages for Java and Ruby and other languages. So we really designed MQLite to plug natively into whatever programming environment that you're using. Uh, the next thing I want to discuss is something that, that could be a little bit controversial and you may not agree with me, but if you really do your own due diligence and you look at the user forums for IBM MQ and ActiveMQ, surprisingly what you find is that ActiveMQ forums are really not that active <laughs> compared to the IBM MQ forums and the response rate is very very different so if you look at stack overflow or even most importantly mqseries.net so that's really the main forum for mq and for ibm integration bus you will find over 60,000 topics with roughly 380,000 posts compared to about 15,000 topics on active mq so there's a couple of orders of magnitude difference in the number of responses and the levels of activity on these forums and if you look at the average responses per question it's much higher on IBM MQ compared to the responses per question on active MQ in fact a lot of the responses on active MQ forums are the same author saying well can help somebody help me uh, just in my own experience when I was doing performance testing and I posted several questions in both Stack Overflow as well as the Apache ActiveMQ user forum, I haven't gotten a single response, unfortunately. So nobody seemed to bother to help me um, with helping me tune the performance of ActiveMQ. And I, I'm not really sure why. And there are a lot of unresponsive threads on those forums. So I think this is very important to have a well supporting community with very fast response rate and good quality of people in that forum and this is something that they really enjoy in mqseries.net and stack overflow with IBM product now from a high level perspective let's just compare IBM MQ and active MQ in several different areas so first of all in terms of the messaging and API's uh, so you could see the APIs overall are somewhat similar except for the fact that ActiveMQ does not support JMS 2.0 at this point. I, I'm sure at some point in the future it will. Uh, and ActiveMQ does not support the option for managed file transfer where it is included with IBM MQ. In terms of failover and quality of services, there is a significant differences. IBM MQ provides reliable failover options where ActiveMQ can lose or duplicate messages and it can disconnect uh, masters in high availability configuration which could be very detrimental to your cluster setup. In terms of scalability, both ActiveMQ and IBM MQ can have multiple instances and many cluster queues uh, so they can be scaled up. Uh, for transaction management, ActiveMQ does not provide it out of the box, but it can act as a participant in XA transactions where IBM MQ can both be XA participant as well as provides its own transaction manager. Performance in IBM MQ is best in class where ActiveMQ is up to two times slower for persistent messages. In terms of administration, We've already discussed that. IBM MQ provides robust graphical administration, command line administration, API for administration, single pane of glass for managing multiple instances, and deployment patterns for smart cloud orchestrator, for IBM pure application system, and on software, so PaaS and software as a service, where ActiveMQ provides limited administrative capabilities and limited platform as a service through third-party offerings. Installation time is actually quite similar. I posted an installation script that can help you install IBM MQ in about 60 seconds on Red Hat Linux or CentOS where with ActiveMQ you just unzip, you point it to the JDK and you're done in about 15 seconds. So yes, there is 45 second difference 
but I don't think that's a big deal. And again, we talked about security where advanced message security is provided with IBM MQ, so it's administrative configuration, where in Active MQ it's a programming effort to secure your messages. And some of the configurations of ActiveMQ could be impacted by the hard bleed bug because it could use OpenSSL, so it really depends on your configuration, where IBM MQ was not impacted by the hard bleed bug at all. Let's talk about cost a little bit. So you see this picture of the iceberg. So what is this 10% versus 90%? Well, this is really the discussion about the total cost of ownership versus the total cost of acquisition. So the total cost of acquisition is what you pay for the license and support. So it's the tip of the iceberg and that's really your TCA. The total cost of ownership is tip of the iceberg and the rest of that iceberg. So the software license cost is usually less than 10% of the project budget where all of the other things like SLA penalties, deployment cost, operational costs, performance differences, cost of evaluation, installation, configuration, management, and all of these things are really hidden and they are very hard to calculate and verify. So it's more like a black art to try and figure out what is really the total cost of ownership. And because of that, most companies, most enterprises don't even bother. They just look at the total cost of acquisition and I think that's a good enough measure where it's really a minority of TCO because the true TCO is very hard to calculate. If you look at some of the industry and university studies, you'll find that most of those studies they agree that over 90% of the total cost of ownership of the project is really not in the software license cost. So it almost doesn't matter how much you pay for the software because it's not the bulk of your costs. Uh, including some of the Forrester consulting reports where they split and they provided a report on the differences, how much you spend on license versus how much you spend on configuration, implementation, procurement and all of the other things. Not to mention the downtime. Depending on the industry, one hour of downtime could be very significant. You probably have seen some of the famous outages on Amazon and some Google and Gmail outages and other outages and there are a lot of money lost for every one hour of the outage. Uh, so you don't really want to have that happen on your website. Support policy of, in this case, Red Hat, Red Hat supporting AMQ, JBoss AMQ product and also JBoss Enterprise Application Platform look at the differences between IBM MQ support and Red Hat AMQ support, then the support policy is very, very similar. The development licenses are free with IBM. There is no charge. Non-production environment has to be supported. If it's a QA environment pre-production, you do have to buy licenses from Red Hat and IBM for all of the non-development but non-production licenses for WebSphere App Server, MQ, JBoss AMQ and JBoss AMP. Uh, you can click the link to get there. But there is a difference in terms of number of support contacts. IBM number of support contacts is unlimited. In case of Red Hat, up to 32 cores you get two people who can call for support. Up to 64 cores you get four contacts and up to 192 cores you get up to 12 contacts so there's a limited number of people that can call for support so it's an inconvenience that's why IBM does not limit the number of people for support so let's talk about pricing finally yes we got here so what does it cost you to buy ActiveMQ from Red Hat Again, this is a tip of the iceberg. That's not TCO. This is TCA, right? Remember, total cost of acquisition, the tip of the iceberg, the 10% of the TCO. Now, if you look at the license of JBoss AMQ versus IBM MQ, what you'll find is that in most configurations, IBM product is cheaper. So what I have here, it's the same number of servers, in my case, 
four servers for all of these configurations but what different is number of sockets per server one socket two sockets four sockets and six sockets number of different cores per socket like 4 to 16 4 to 18 8 to 18 cores per socket and then you have different IBM PVU rating 50 PVUs per socket 70 PVUs, 100 PVUs, and 120 PVUs. All of this is on the x86 hardware. When you calculate the license over five years for IBM and then 10 years, and you compare that to Red Hat, the reason I have 10 years is not because I expect my customers to budget for 10 years, but because in IBM case, in year one, you buy the license, and then year two, three, four, and later, you pay 20% of that for support. So it's only 20% for all of the subsequent years. In case of JBoss, the support payments are flat. It's the same first year, second year, third year, and so forth. So in case of IBM, if I draw the graph, it's license cost high in year one, and then only 20% for support. So your payments are not spread evenly like in case of Red Hat. In case of Red Hat, you pay flat. So it's less in year one, but it's more in year two, three, four, and ten. For 100 years, it would be even more. The other thing, you notice I have without required components and with required components. What is this saying, with required components? So with required components is when you buy JDK support, because you need JDK to run AMQ. You can buy it from Oracle or you can use unsupported OpenJDK or OpenJDK supported on Red Hat Linux. You also may need to buy HTTP server for ActiveMQ or JBoss Operations Network, which would require you to use database and that database costs money and you need to have a hardware server to run that database for configuration of JBoss Operations Network, which will manage your JBoss AMQ. So in that case, you will see IBM is less expensive, and there is also a performance factor difference. If you click on this link on the bottom of the chart, you will go to the blog article where I have the cost calculator, so you can actually open the spreadsheet yourself and calculate the cost for your own configuration. But remember, this is TCA, total cost of acquisition. There is a lot to be said about the license versus operational costs. How reliable is this? Are you losing messages? Are you duplicating messages? Can you manage? Can you monitor? How easy it is? Uh, how secure is this? So TCA is not the end of the world. You really shouldn't be focused too much on TCA. So what's the roadmap for Red Hat messaging and for Apache ActiveMQ? If you look at the messaging in JBoss, back in 2002 they had something called JBoss MQ. Then they got rid of it, it didn't work well. They shipped JBoss messaging in 2006. They said that was the best messaging ever. Then they got rid of it because it didn't work well. In 2009, they shipped Hornet Q. They said that was a, absolutely the best thing since a slice of bread. It was the best messaging ever, faster than anything anybody ever produced. Now, that turned out not to be the case. They're getting rid of Hornet Q. They bought Fuse, and now ActiveMQ is supposedly being recommended. But that turns out not to be good enough, and that's why Apache Apollo is now a new project and the re rewrite of Apache Cupid, which is a basis for Red Hat MRG product, being rewritten and merged. So Hornet Q being input, Apache ActiveMQ being input, and the Cupid being input into the whatever new best messaging Red Hat will provide. So we'll see how it works and when they ship it and how long that survives until the next re-engineering cycle comes along. In contrast to that, IBM MQ has been steady, backwards compatible, with migration pass where there wasn't one provided with all of these JBoss interruptions, and customers were able to rely on MQ, reliable, solid, high-performance messaging, year-to-year for many years, 
uh, in the past and hopefully many years to come. Some of the aspects that I covered in my presentation today, such as high availability, were researched and published by Edison Group in 2014 and you can download the white paper from the URL listed on the bottom of this chart and you can read the white paper, you can post your comments, questions, suggestions, ideas, objections on that blog. I'll be happy to respond and folks from Edison Group will be happy to respond and you can read it. It covers failover, transactional integrity and administration topics. So big thanks for, to Edison Group. This research was commissioned by IBM so obviously you probably will take it with a grain of salt but it was done independently and it's very open. It's all published. The methodology is completely open. The same thing as with my performance benchmarks. All of that is open. You can download all of the scripts, all of the configuration. I'm not hiding anything. I don't have anything to hide. URL is ywebsphere.com. One word. Feel free to subscribe. You can go into this right hand top corner and you can subscribe right here. If you're not subscribed, you'll see this field where you can enter your email address. Press the subscribe button and you'll get emails whenever there's a new blog article, usually roughly about once a week, uh, sometimes a couple of times a month, sometimes more. There are quite a few nice articles uh, and sessions that were presented on IBM MQ at the IBM Interconnect 2015 conference. A lot of these sessions are now available on SlideShare. So if you go to the slideshare.com and you search for IBM Interconnect 2015 or you search for IBM MQ, a lot of these presentations you can download for free and some of them have voice recording and video recording for these presentations. So it's a really nice resource for you. Uh, take advantage of that. Thank you very much. I hope you found it useful. And again, I'm looking forward to your comments and suggestions on the blog.